Good morning and welcome to Life Plus Church online on Sunday the 18th of October 2020. I just want to um, say hi to all of those folk out there that are watching us via the YouTube or Facebook platforms. I just want to say a very warm welcome to you and we hope that you, you're receiving um, some some great insights into the Word of God through the ministry and, and through the worship. And so this morning, before we pray, I'm going to open from a Psalm 8 as we um, come around uh, the time of worship and just focusing on the Lord. So I'm reading from Psalm 8 and it says here, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Wonderful. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you today, Lord God, that as we come to worship you, Lord God, in spirit and in truth, we thank you, Lord, that you've promised that you'll be enthroned on the praises of your people today, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, Lord, that you are coming and resting in those places. And so, Father, we just ask for a fresh impartation into our lives, Lord, taking us from one degree of glory to another. And so, Lord, we just want to bless your holy name today. Bless all my brothers and sisters, Father God, um, throughout the, the world that are just worshipping with you right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Lord, we're going to sing a song by Joshua Ian called There Is None Like You.
open our hearts to receive something from you. Direct the Lord to speak in our lives today. Uh, let me give you a title to my message. It's simply this, God's glory, humanity's greatest need. God's glory, humanity's greatest need. Last week I got off track just a wee bit with my message. Um, I spoke about how we had to be open to the Lord, how the Lord Jesus himself, when he was baptized in the River Jordan, the Bible says that the heavens were opened. The heavens were open, and so I just, uh, as a kind of a sidetrack, I, I spoke about on Sunday um, to the church here in Blairgowrie about how God opens the heavens, how He has opened the heavens, and we also need to open ourselves so there's a direct uh, connection between ourselves and the heavens uh, and the things that God is doing on the earth. And so I began to speak about, uh, just very quickly, that kind of thing. And um, what we notice, Matthew chapter 3, I'd just like us to look at this uh, passage before we get into this message today. Um, because the Father spoke at this time, in Matthew 3, uh, verse 13 to 17. Let's read it together, please. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now. For thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up and immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is an interesting statement by the Father, simply because of this. Father was pleased with Jesus even before he did anything in regards to his ministry on the earth. It was before his ministry even began. The Father was saying, I am pleased with my Son. That tells me that the Father in heaven is also pleased with those who belong to him. The Father is pleased with you. I just want to say that as a, an affirmation for you today. The Father is pleased with you. You might think, I'm not doing very much for the Lord. But I'll tell you this, folks. I'll tell you this, brothers and sisters. There is still time to do great and wonderful things for the Lord in the days that lie ahead. So please, don't put yourself down. The Father wants to encourage you. He is well pleased with those who love Jesus. He is well pleased with you. Even before you may have done very much to advance the kingdom of God, there is still time to do that. We know the verse very well in John 3, 16, don't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We know this verse. We quote this verse. We tell people that don't know Jesus, this is how much God loves you. Sometimes we have to tell it to ourselves and remind ourselves that the Father loves us. God has forgiven us as Christians. So we know the Father loves us, don't we? Or do we? Or do we? Towards the end of this message, I want to just uh, re-emphasize this love that God has for us as Christians. The Father is well pleased with his children. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're going through right now. And he says, I am pleased with you. There is time to build the kingdom. God has been bringing all of us together at this time, I believe, in order to build his kingdom, in order to have something wonderful take place in our midst that I believe is already happening, but is going to increase as time goes on. Smith Wigglesworth, that apostle of faith, tremendous man of God, he gave a word of prophecy in 1947 concerning the church in the United Kingdom. And here's what he said. He said, during the next few decades, there will be two distinct moves of the Holy Spirit across the church in Great Britain. The first moves will affect every church that is open to receive it and will be characterized by the restoration of the baptism and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's already happened. 
The second move of the Holy Spirit will result in people leaving historic churches and planting new churches. In the duration of each of these new moves, the people involved will say, This is a great revival. But the Lord says, No, neither is this the great revival, but both are steps towards it. When the church phase is on the wane, and perhaps we might say that that's what's taking place in our time, there will be evidence in the churches of something that has not been seen before. A coming together of those with an emphasis on the Word and those with an emphasis on the Spirit. When the Word and the Spirit come together, they will be the biggest move of this Holy Spirit that the nations and indeed the world has ever seen. It will mark the beginning of a revival that will eclipse anything that has been witnessed within these shores, even the Wesleyan and Welsh revivals of former years. The outpouring of God's Spirit will flow over the United Kingdom to mainland Europe and from there will begin a missionary move to the ends of the earth. Now this prophecy, if you've been in the church for a while as well, is well known throughout the church. And as I'm listening to what has taken place across the earth just now and what God is saying to his church, indeed what the Lord is saying to us as a church, I believe we are already beginning to witness the fulfillment of this prophecy. For example, the Lord's promises to us from Isaiah 60, let me just read them to you again. Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 5, it speaks of this very same situation. Listen to this. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together. They come to you, your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the seas shall be turned to you, the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The most prominent part of this passage here that has been speaking to me over and over again is simply this one. It's a part of verse 2, the last part. And his glory will be seen upon you. His glory will be seen upon you. I have been laboring this with the Lord now for some time because I believe that the people outside the church, they need this. They need this from the church. They need to see the glory of the Lord upon us again. Upon his church again. You know, a number of weeks ago, the Lord spoke to me very clearly. He spoke to me very clearly. I've already mentioned this in our prayer meetings. That the word that we've just read accurately describes what has taken place on the earth today. The prophecy itself, of course, is a messianic prophecy. It's concerning the Lord Jesus and his coming to the earth as the Messiah of Israel and of the earth. That he would visit the world, but he would also visit the non-Jews. He would receive the Gentiles into his life as well, into his kingdom as well. That they also would be saved. You know, during the time of Christ on the earth and his betrayal, his judgment and his death, we know that Jesus took the sins of the world instead of the world taking them themselves. It was a time of judgment, folks. It was a time where God had to judge the world again. Sin had reached the tipping point on the earth. And the Father must be true to himself. He must judge evil. He tells us in the book of Exodus, he will know the way will he leave the guilty unpunished. God must punish sin to stay righteous to himself, to stay just to himself. However, at the time of Christ, he had mercy on the peoples of the earth and instead he came to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ and he underwent the judgment of the Father himself. Now fast forward to today. Remember what the Lord Jesus said about the end of the age in Luke 6, 17 and verse 26. It says this, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. 
In other words, before the Lord returns, the earth will have returned to a place of darkness, of deep darkness, prior to and during the times of Noah on the earth. Noah preached for, I believe, 125 years. He, he preached for a long, long time to try and convince people that God was about to judge the earth. Nobody listened. Nobody listened. They all rejected his cries to save themselves and to turn from their wickedness, but they did not. And so I believe in both cases, in the time of Noah and in the time of Jesus, in both cases, Isaiah was accurate in his description of what humanity would return to. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. This likewise is what the Lord was pointing out to me of the people of this age. In their perceptions of God, there's a deep darkness that has covered the minds of the people. But here's the good news. God has the answer. God is the answer. And the answer to darkness is what? The answer to darkness is, is light. Just switch the light on and you can see everything. And Jesus said, I am the light. God is the light. And this is where we are at, I believe, right now, folks. God is switching on the light. Or he is, he's, if you can imagine a dimmer switch, he is switching the dimmer switch up. He is turning the light up. That light within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it will begin to shine brighter and brighter even as the world gets darker and darker. And this is why the Lord, I believe, has kept me focusing on the glory of the Lord for such a long time now. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, Behold, is it not the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire and nations weary themselves in vain? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. People are getting weary. For millions, their whole world has been turned upside down. Millions have lost their jobs during this whole coronavirus thing. They have nowhere to find answers. And this is what the darkness does for us. It leaves us empty and dead. It strips us bare and leaves us with nothing. And yet all the while the Lord has the answer. And we as the church, we have the answer. Because it's right here. It's right within us. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And where is this knowledge to come from? Except the church. We have the answer, folks. We have the answer. And it's time for the church to rise up and present to this world the glory of the Lord. The glory of the risen Christ. That is our responsibility in these times. I believe with all my heart to bring the light of Jesus into this dark world again. For it will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord. You know, it's one thing to hear a message about the glory of the Lord. It is another thing to comprehend it and experience that glory. But I believe that is where we are today. The Lord is already beginning to pour out His glory across the earth. Something is happening. God has given us signs that something is beginning to take place in this nation, even within this fellowship. And one of the signs is the answers to prayer. We are experiencing this ourselves as an acceleration in the answers to prayer. They're happening more rapidly. At times overnight, at times straight away. And this is akin to a move of the Holy Spirit that has already begun to happen among us. But it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. The world desperately needs a move of God's Spirit. And that is why we are crying out to the Lord that His Spirit will move upon us. But you know, I see that there's a problem also within the ranks of the church. And I want to address that today. Not to condemn or to, you know, to point the finger, folks, 
But if there's something going on that we need to uh, make adjustments to, then let's be willing and open to do that. I believe the Lord has given me something here today that He wants me to focus on. We need to understand what the glory of the Lord is going to look like. Because unless we experience something, we can't really have a handle on what it's about. We can't really understand what is going on. One of the things that would help us, I believe, to remember in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that the very substance of truth itself means to experience it. And that is personal truth as well as corporate truth. And this is why Jesus did what he did. Jesus didn't just tell the disciples about the kingdom of God. He didn't just talk to them about miracles that can take place. He didn't just teach the people about the kingdoms of God. He also, the kingdom of God, he also demonstrated the kingdom to them, didn't he? In John 2 verse 11, after Jesus had turned the water into wine, we read about the effects that this had on his disciples. Verse 11, John chapter 2, this beginning of signs, the beginning of signs, and I believe that that's what's happening to us right now. We are entering into the beginning of signs, and this was a wonderful entry for Jesus. Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. His disciples believed in him. This miracle was deemed to be a manifestation of the glory of God, of the glory of Christ. And this is my point today. Answered prayer is a manifestation of the glory of God. Answered prayer is a manifestation of the glory of God. Answered prayer is a miracle of God. And it carries with it a double blessing. Listen to this. Because not only do we see the Lord give an answer to our prayers, but we also experience a similar effect that the disciples did. We believe in Him. It boosts our faith. It boosts our confidence. It boosts our love for Him. It boosts our trust in God when He answers prayers. And when He does supernatural works. It affects all of these things. We experience His glory. We enter into the glory of the Lord. It is a manifestation of His glory. Let me ask you a question. How many of us here today, how many of us watching today, have experienced God answering prayer? Put your hands up. I can't see you. However, I trust that you're putting your hands up and saying, yes, God has answered many prayers. Well, the answering of your prayers is the manifestation of the glory of God. And it should increase your faith. It should increase your love for Him. It should increase your trust in God that He is capable of continuing, continuing to answer your prayers. And I believe, folks, I believe in the days ahead, God is going to answer your prayers faster, quicker than you've ever seen before. Because I believe that the glory of the Lord is intensifying within the church. It is increasing within the church. And I would ask you to begin to expect the God, the Lord of the Bible, to move greater, stronger, and quicker in your life as you pray and present your requests to Him. You see, the glory is all that God is. Everything He does reflects His glory toward mankind. There's a greater level of the glory of God coming. You know, even in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said this, to teach his disciples. He said, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is it right here. Jesus' most famous prayer, teaching his disciples. He makes such a quick mention of the priority of the Father's will will be done on the earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But for that to be even possible means that the glory of the Lord has to be involved. The glory of the Lord has to be operating. So we're looking at the glory of God increasing in such a way that the answers to our prayers are going to move into a much higher level than ever before. Expect it, saints. Expect it to happen. 
expected to happen. The healing miracles of Jesus were like an acceleration of the healing process in many examples. For many, that healing process had not been activated at all. In fact, for many, it was not even possible for there to be an activation unless God steps in. Crippled limbs, blind eyes, deaf ears, leprosy that would eat away the flesh, raising the dead, incurable is what doctors would say. Not possible what the scientists would say today. In Matthew chapter 17, in verse 14 to 20, Jesus is confronted by this man whose son is epileptic. And the Bible says he comes to, to Jesus and he, he says to him, My son is an epileptic. And sometimes he gets thrown into the fire. I took him to your disciples and they, and they, they couldn't do anything about it. And so I brought them to you and when we look at that, the, the, the disciples themselves had problems with this whole thing, obviously. And the minute this man said that the disciples couldn't cast this thing out, Jesus responds to that, to that failure. How does he respond? Well, hard lines, lads, it was, at least you tried. At least you tried. Is that how Jesus saw things? I don't think so. Jesus gives his reply to this news. In verse 17 he says to this man and to the disciples who were obviously there at the time, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? He wasn't too pleased with the disciples. Hardly words of encouragement. Why not Lord? Why didn't he just say, well, at least, he, at least he tried? Why did he not encourage them? Well, Jesus tells us why not. He goes on and says, bring him to me, bring the boy to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why can we not cast it out? So Jesus said to him, because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith in the mustard seed, you will say this mountain move from here and there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you. We have this old enemy of faith, unbelief, raising his ugly head. Folks, this is a problem in the church today. As I said earlier, this is not to point the finger. It's just to state of fact. This is a problem in the church today. It is a problem for many of you people watching today. And please hear me, it's not to criticize you, but it is an awakening for us. It is an awakening for us because the Lord is saying, a time is coming when the glory of the Lord is going to minister to people like this. And He's going to use you to minister to them. How will you cope with that? How will you cope with that? How will you deal with that? Or do we believe that demons have just all gone now and they don't exist any longer? What would we do with this? Would we just run away? Would we not get involved perhaps? Would your first thought be, I'll call for the elders of the church because the Bible tells us to. Phew, thank you, James 5.14. You just got me out of that one. Is that how we're going to approach things? Folks, Jesus is saying to the church, I'm going to cause you to grow up in these times. We are coming of age, church. We are coming of age. You may not be thinking that you're very much, but God is saying, no, I have called you to this age, to the very end of the end of the age, for a time such as this. And I have prepared you. And I will anoint you. And I will pour out my spirit upon you. And you will do mighty works for God. Mighty works for the Lord. But here's the thing. If we are willing to receive it, if we are willing to receive it. This is so important. Remember Wigglesworth's word, the first part of this, of this message. The first move of God, he says, will affect every church that are open to receive it. That are open to receive it. 
Are you open to receive what God is doing on earth today? Because if we know anything about the moving of the life of the church, of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church, we also know this. We must be open to whatever God wants to do with His church. This is faith in action. The Bible says faith without, de without works is dead. So we have to activate our faith. God can only work with faith. He can only work with an open heart and an open mind and a willingness. He cannot operate with a heart and mind that resists him. When he finds this, he will eventually move on, folks. Scotland has got, has got hundreds of old church buildings now lying in ruins or being turned into museums or restaurants or whatever. We have them in this town itself in Blair Gowrie and it breaks God's heart. It breaks my heart. To see that what was once something of the glory of the Lord in a town or in a village or in the cities is now lying in ruins. But this is what happens when we don't embrace the things of God, when we don't receive the things of the Spirit, God will eventually move on. And today, in 2020, God is saying it is time. I am going to cause you to grow up. You have come of age. And I'm about to pour out my spirit. I already am pouring it out. But I need you to embrace this. I need you to open up your hearts, church. Jesus was really ticked off with his disciples. And I believe it's because of this. He, did, he expected them to do better. He expected them to be able to deal with that situation. And they did not. And he was ticked off with them. Come on, church. There's an expectation on behalf of the Father and behalf of the Son and behalf of the Holy Spirit for the church to, to grow up and to mature and begin to deal with situations like this. Deep darkness has covered the earth. You know, I believe that there is one reason why most in the modern church today who have kind of laid down the mantle that Jesus had revealed to us in regards to healings and miracles is not particularly based on unbelief as such. I believe it's based on fear. I believe that unbelief is like a, an, an outcome. It's like a product of fear. I believe we don't do things because we are afraid of what it might mean to get that involved in the things of the Spirit. Are you afraid of the supernatural? I'm just asking that question straight out because I believe that's what's in my heart to ask you. Are you afraid of the supernatural? Are you afraid of, of what the Holy Spirit is capable of? Do you think He is going to be, you know, cause you to be out of control in some way? This is why our love for God is so important. And this is why our understanding of how much He loves us is so important, brothers and sisters. God loves you. Father loves you. He knows what you're capable of. He knows exactly what you're able to do and not to do. You know, we can read sometimes passages in the Bible and we develop a fear that has gone off the rails, has gone in the wrong direction. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah di died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He's having visions of heaven. Above him stood seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. And we read articles like this. We read passages like this. And we say, oh no, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to cope with anything like that. But the sad part of this is, folks, if we step back from, uh, from being involved in the supernatural aspects of God, then we will not move on to where Isaiah moved on himself. 
He saw himself in light of the holiness of God and he says, Woe to me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Well, Jesus has already taken care of the unclean lips, hasn't he? The blood of Christ, if you're a Christian, the blood of Christ has already cleansed you. This was his cleansing time. Well, Jesus has already done that for us. But here was the outcome when the Lord said to him, Who will I send? Who will we send? Who will go for us? And the prophet, having his lips cleansed, having his sins forgiven, he stands up and he says, Here am I. You can send me. And this is the sad, this is the sadness about, about many of us in the church that are, that are born again and we're spirit filled and we are, we are cleansed from all of our sins and yet we don't step forward and say, here I am Father, send me. But God is calling us in this day, God is calling you in this day to step forward and say, here I am Father, send me. Because this move of God is coming folks. It's not just going to be for, 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 um, for those who are in you know, ministry, for the, for the leaders. It's going to be for the whole church. Can you imagine every Christian moving in the power and the love of Christ on the earth? That's what's going to bring in the light of Christ again. That's what's going to dead in the darkness. That's what's going to shine in the darkness again. And bring many souls into his kingdom as people like you. People like me, be willing to stand up and say, Father, here I am, send me. We need to open up. We need to open up. Don't allow fear, please. Don't allow fear to cause us to back off all the time. Fear is the devil's playground. And the Bible tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love that casts out all fear. And a sound mind. The devil is playing with your mind. The devil has twisted the word of God in your mind. And he wants you to operate in fear. He wants you to recoil on the inside. And leave up for someone else to do. This is a trick of the devil. This is a lie of the devil. We think God is going to overwhelm us. God will not overwhelm us. He knows exactly how to treat his children. The father loves you. With an everlasting love. How could we bring such an accusation against the love of God who knows everything about us? Please don't fall for this old lie of the devil to bring fear into your life and to cause you to, to back off when God is desperately needing his church to step up and to move forward. Boldness. He is looking for boldness. He is looking for courage. He is looking for love. He's looking for us to meet him halfway in this so we can embrace what he is doing on the earth today. God is bringing the answer, folks. You are the answer. You are the one that carries the light of Jesus upon the earth. He's bringing his love and his joy and his peace and his patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. He is bringing the fruit of the Spirit to a world that desperately needs it. But he is also bringing the gifts of the Spirit also. The manifestation of the glory of the Lord is manifested through the gifts of the Holy Spirit also. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to profit everyone. People in the church, people outside the church, everyone. This is the Father's agenda for the gifts of the Spirit. For to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another the word of knowledge. To another or by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit, the same Holy Spirit, works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. This is the Father's pattern. This is how God has done it. This is how Jesus operated on the earth by the power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, let me say this. God needs the church to open up again to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to the life of Jesus Christ, to the light of Jesus Christ 
operating in our world today that has got so dark that God calls us a deep darkness. Jesus wants us to partner with him again and to be open to move and allow the glory of God to move in our hearts, to move in our lives, to make a difference. There's a multitude of people all around us that don't know Jesus Christ. And God is saying, this revival is coming. It has already started and it's going to increase. That's God's message for us today. You know, Jesus didn't just invite us or didn't politely ask us to love one another. He commanded it. He commanded us to love one another. And he did that because he knew the kind of world in which we are going to live. Do you love the Lord with all your heart? Do you love your brother and sister also? It is very important that we do. Because listen to what the Bible says about love. And about fellowship, about unity and connecting with one another. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1 says this. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifest in Jesus, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that the eternal life, which was, which, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Verse 5. This is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This is why God is the answer, folks. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We can only have fellowship true fellowship with one another when we are all walking in the light and there is no darkness in us at all. And the Bible calls it walking in truth, walking in reality. God wants us to get connected in the things of His Spirit. Some years ago, I had a relationship with this brother in Christ that just seemed to be disconnected all the time. I'm not going to give you any details, but no matter how hard I tried to connect with this person, it just wasn't happening. I labored in prayer about the whole thing. I beat myself up and said, Lord, it must be me. It must be me, it must be my fault. And I went through and I, I repented of things and I asked the Lord to, to help me and to, 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 to draw closer to this person because I wanted to have Christian fellowship with this person. But it just never seemed to happen. There was all there was this disconnect. And eventually everything came to a head. And the truth came out. That this person had his own agenda. He had his own plans for me. He had his own plans for himself, etc., etc. And I eventually discovered that that disconnection was not because of my own unwillingness to be connected. It was his unwillingness to be connected to me. There are people watching this today and there are people in your life that you just cannot connect with. You have tried and tried and tried. You've tried to connect with them. You've beaten yourself up. You have prayed, Father, what is wrong? Why can't I connect with this person? I want to tell you today, as a word from the Lord, I believe, it's not because of you. It's because of them. They don't want to connect with you. They are the strings attached to the relationship you have with them. And the Lord would say this, put it to sleep. Pray for them, but understand this, if they will not comply with your, uh, your attempts, then just draw a line under it 
and begin to move on. Begin to move on. Let me just tell you something else, please. There are people you have to grow past. God will cause you to grow past certain people. As well as situations. But I have noticed over the years as a Christian that people that I held and, and, and um, you know, in and, and some, some ways far more spiritual than I would from my own estimates. And yet there was something about them that just seemed to be stuck at a, at a level and not able to move past it. And I have witnessed and prayed for them and prayed with them even, etc., etc. But they don't seem to move past things. Perhaps it's unforgiveness. Perhaps it's just pride in their life. But they are stuck in a rut and they don't move past it. And I have noticed that over the years, over a, a, sometimes a lengthy period of time, I have grown past them, spiritually speaking. And the reason I've done that is simply this, not to boast in myself by any means, but the Lord has said to me, he says, be faithful in the little things. Some of you today, all God is asking you to do is this, be faithful in the little things. Because when you're faithful in the little things, God will cause you to grow and grow and grow and grow. It is believers that are unfaithful in the little things that eventually just get stuck in a rut. And the Lord says, not for you. That's not my will or my heart for my children anywhere on the earth. Be faithful in the little things and you will discover you will grow beyond some people that perhaps you're trying to connect with and they're not interested. Draw a line under it and move on, brother and sister. We are called to truth in the innermost parts. We are called to have unity. We are called to love one another. And it is only as we walk in truth that we can have true fellowship with one another. You know, in Judaism, love is something that has obviously practical aspects to it. And here, here is their, their definition of practical love. And I listened to a Jewish rabbi some years ago now, and he gave a very simple explanation concerning love in action. And he, and he put it like this. He said, if you, if you are working in an office situation, and you have, you're the person that makes a coffee at coffee break, and you do it over and over and over, it's like you're, you're expected to do it kind of thing. He says, here, here is what I would advise you to do. Just stop doing it on one occasion and invite somebody else to do it. Just ask somebody else, would you make the coffee today? And see what their response is. And if they, if they look at you with a kind of, well, why should I do attitude? Or if they make some excuse, then he says that person is not operating in love. He says love is reciprocal. I help you and you help me. And there's no, there's no kind of you know, attitude between that. That's what, that's what practical love is. If you are doing for someone, doing for someone, doing for someone, and then you invite them to do something from you, for you, and there's a kind of like an, an outcry, or there's a resistance to that, then that person is not operating in love. They're actually just abusing the friendship. They're abusing the friendship. And so you need to tell them. You need to say, you know, I, I do for you, I do for you, I do for you. But the minute I ask you to do something for me, there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's this resistance. And if this person is a Christian, you need to say the love of Jesus is not operating in your life in that respect. Come on, let's, do, let's, let's, let's help one another. Let there be unity among us. This is what the Bible is telling us. This is what John is telling us. If there is some darkness in a person's life, you can't have true fellowship with them. Though try and try as you might, you can't have true fellowship because they're not operating in truth. They're not operating in truth. Jesus said of Nathaniel in John 1 verse 47, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile, no guile. The word guile here is a Greek word, dolos. 
and it means to bait or to snare or to be subtle. Jesus was saying Nathaniel had none of these. There was no strings attached to this man. He was a man of truth. He was not there to bait me. He was not there to set a snare for me or to have some kind of other agenda going on. He was a true Israelite. No strings attached. His heart was true. Which means his heart walked in reality. This is what true, the word truth means. It means reality. Jesus said of himself, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Here's what he was saying. I'm the way to the reality of all life. That's what he was saying. Truth is reality. I am the way to the reality of life itself. In Australia you have a saying. A good friend of mine who's passed on now, sadly. He used to say this all the time. If he thought I was joking with him, he would just look at me and say, Oh, just be real. Be real. And I would laugh in fits of laughter. But that's what Jesus is saying to his church at this time. Be real, church. It's time to be real. It's time to allow the glory of God to come and fill his church again and be real to this world because I want to show up. The glory of the Lord is rising upon his church. The glory of the Lord will rise upon you. Will rise upon you. Will you open your heart and allow him to rise upon you and to be the light in the darkness that he needs at this time? Some 30 odd years ago, when Bonnie and I were still young in Christ, we attended our local church. I'm going to finish with this. A church in Glendale in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia. On this occasion, some students came from Bible, uh, Commonwealth Bible College um, uh, in Katoomba, which is uh, just west of Sydney, up in the mountains. And they had come to minister this day at church. One of the students was a man called David Taylor. And after the meeting, I got in a short conversation with David. I'd never met this man before in my whole life. Never ever. I knew nothing about him. But within about a minute or a couple of minutes, there was such a connection between us. He was like a long lost friend. He became like a long lost brother. And indeed he was to me in that respect, spiritually speaking. But there was such a connection, such a unity with us. Bonnie and I eventually we attended that same college and David was still there. And he kind of took me under his wing and he showed me you know, how, the, how things operate, how to study properly, and so on. And it was a great blessing to me. That's someone who has a heart that opens up and says, I'm your brother in Christ. I don't know you, I know nothing about you, but I am your brother in Christ. That is the unity. That is how it should be, folks. That is how it should be. That is the love of Jesus Christ, bringing unity within the body of Christ, bringing God's love to the very forefront of what he wants to do on the earth today. Will you open up? Will you ask God for his love to fill you every day? Every day. Will you, will you lay down any agendas that you have? Will you lay down things that are darkness to you? that are stopping you from having fellowship one with another. Will you lay them down today even and say, Father, forgive me. I lay that thing down. I lay that unforgiveness down. I lay that resentment and that anger down. I, I, I get rid of all of it, Father God, that I may enjoy your love and have sweet fellowship with my brothers and sisters again. God loves you. And God's love for his church is beyond our understanding. But in these days, he's saying, I need you to open up. I need you to invite Jesus in again. It's a Revelation 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will come in and open the door. I will come in and eat with them and them with me. You know, we often use this verse as a, an evangelistic type message. But it was for the church. 
It is for the church. Jesus is speaking to his people. He is speaking to you. He's saying, will you open the door of your heart again to me? Will you invite me in again? So we can have fellowship, sweet fellowship. Because when we do that, we will have fellowship with one another. And every wicked thing, every, every evil, every darkness, everything of darkness will be eliminated when we invite Jesus in. This is Christian unity. This is how it should be. Invite Jesus today. Recognize your fears. I'm just finishing now. Number one, recognize your fears. Write them down. Name them. And begin to take them on. Head on. In the power of the Holy Spirit that God has given you. Deal with your fears. Deal with anything else that comes between you and the Father. And you and your brothers and sisters. Deal with them. Like Paul when he was shipwrecked. And that snake fast, that separate, fastened itself to his, to his arm. And he, and he shook it off. It's time to shake things off church. Shake things off. And invite Jesus in. My heart's cry is a God that is bringing unity to the church through his glory. Will you open your heart up today? Will you say, Father, I am open to you today. I invite you in. I have an open heaven above me. I invite you in. I open up my heart so that heaven and earth can connect together. There's nothing between us, Father, in heaven. And I can pour out the love of Jesus Christ to this generation, you pour the glory in and I will pour the glory out. That's my message today. God bless you. If you don't know Jesus Christ, then let me just say this. Jesus came and he died for you. He died that you might have the opportunity to receive eternal life because your sins have separated you from God Almighty. God cannot allow sin into his perfect heaven. He just won't. He needs you to confess your sins. He needs you to understand that Jesus paid the penalty for your sins so you don't have to. Now if you put your trust in what Jesus did for you, you can enter eternal life because you will never do it on your own. It only took one sin to break communion with God in the beginning. And we sin many, many times throughout our lives. There's a barrier between us and God. God says Jesus has removed it. But you must repent of your sins. You must change your mind. You must now look to me to give you eternal life. And if you will do that, if you will trust in what Jesus did for you, if you will believe that God raised him from the dead and he now offers you eternal life, then God will gladly give it to you. I'm just going to pray a short prayer. And I ask you and invite you to confess your sins and to receive Christ as your Lord and your Saviour today. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you that you died for me, Lord Jesus. That you paid the full penalty for my sin so that I don't have to. I repent of my sins now. I change my mind. I ask you, Father, to forgive me for all of my sins. I ask you to give me your Holy Spirit to cleanse me from every wicked thing I've done, every wrong thing I've done. I receive you, Lord Jesus, as my Saviour and my Lord. I give my life over to you now. Lead me and direct me in the way I should go from this day forward and for the rest of my life. Prepare me for heaven, please. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for watching. And I trust you will be back to watch again next week. God is doing great things, folks. Be encouraged. Despite what's going on in the earth, be encouraged. God is on the move. God bless you. And bye for now.